Hey, we're going to be in John chapter 11 today. And we're going to read the, the passage, and then we're going to pray for it. And then you can sit down. How's that? Okay, John chapter 11, verse 38. Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against him. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the, pe the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. <laughs> then the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them, Caiaphas, become, or being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is an expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Verse 53, then from that day on they plotted to put him to death. Therefore Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that it might seize him. Lord, we come before you as we look to this passage, Lord. Uh, we want to be instructed by your word. We want to have hope in the resurrection and what you're doing, Lord. We are so grateful for all that you do in our lives, Lord. And we pray, Father God, that your spirit would speak to us, reminding us of the resurrection hope that we have in Jesus. So bless this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, I started to call this uh, title, It's All About God's Glory. Uh, then I thought, God's glory revealed in the resurrection. So the title is, It's All About God's Glory. God's glory revealed in the resurrection. Because they were both just so accurate. How could you say no to that? Last week in our message was, if God loves me, why? In response to Mary and Martha wanting Jesus to come right away and heal their brother, but he didn't, and then he died. But also, many among us who right now um, are and have been and will go through times of pain and sorrow and disappointment. Through the deteriorating health, though, through deteriorating health and the death of a loved one, a relationship, an unanswered prayer, or a host of other hardships. But that's the reason we're here. I love this passage in Romans 15:4. It says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, our learning, that we, through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. That's why we go through the Bible. We want hope for what the Word of God tells us. And I was thinking about that. If you look at that passage, it says, Whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Scriptures is capitalized. Now, it's interesting, when you look at the Bible, when you look at pronouns, if a pronoun is capitalized, generally that means deity, that means God. Like if it said, talk about Jesus and use the word him, the H would be capitalized. Or he, the H would be capitalized. Well, here, S in scriptures is capitalized. And it reminds me how it says in the beginning of John, the very first verse, in the beginning was the Word, capitalized, and the Word, capitalized, was with God, and the Word, capitalized, was God. Because you know what? Jesus is the Word of God. 
And that's where our hope is. It's in God and it's through his word where he reveals these truths to us. And in the beginning of, of the, the, the gospel of John, it talks about that. And then it says that we might believe. That we might believe. You know, guys, because the, the, this world is not our home. This world is not our home. We shared this the other day. Revelation 21, it says that God will wipe, will dwell with his people. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There should, there should be no more pain for the former things that passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. That's why we have hope in the resurrection. In verses 25, going back to last week, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe in this? That is the hope that we have in the resurrection. Last week I read from Romans 11, talking about the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And I finished with Romans 11:36. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. To whom be glory. When Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, the last part of that uh, prayer is, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. This phrase, to him be glory forever and ever, is many, many times repeated in Scripture. Uh, just, just reading it this week in Galatians, Ephesians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Hebrews, 1 Peter, Jude, Revelation, to him be the glory forever and ever. What does that have to do with us? We were created for God's glory. We talked about that, Isaiah 43, 7, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Revelation 4.11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and we were created. And we talked about in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, we're God's property and we're to glorify him. In other words, it's not about us. We live in a culture that says it's all about you, but in God's eyes, it's not all about you. It's about him. And what does it mean to glorify? It means to acknowledge and reveal the majesty and splendor of God by one's actions, to praise, worship, and exalt his name by our words and life. That's a great definition of, of what it is to glorify. You know, yesterday, uh, a handful of us, I know some people are here, were at a friend of ours' house named Julio. Julio's a good friend of ours. Julio and Judy, they live about a mile here. They had a housewarming party. And he gave, came up and gave a testimony of his life. And I knew a lot of stuff about him, but yeah, he, he went through a lot of stuff. Him and his wife both. All these trials and challenges. And, and they were glorifying Lord, the Lord. And I thought, I like what she said, because she's had a lot of health issues. And lost her job and all these things. But she says, you know, these trials weren't really trials. There's people with worse trials than I have. And right now she's ministering to a woman whose husband is dying. And she said, you know what, I want to be a, a woman that helps battered women, that helps women that don't have anybody. And I thought, that is a woman who wants to glorify the Lord. And that's what God wants to do with our lives. Whatever we're going through, he wants to use us that he would be glorified. And so I have three points in this message for you note takers. Point one, God's glory always has believing in mind. God's glory always has believing in mind. That's verses 38 to 45. Second point, God's glory is revealed in resurrection power. God's glory is revealed in resurrection power, verse 43 and 45. And then the third point, God's glory should be the highest priority for religious leaders and believers. God's glory should be the highest priority for religious leaders and believers in verse 46 through 53. So point one, God's glory always has believing in mind. Point two, God's glory is revealed in resurrection power. And point through three, God's glory should be the highest priority for religious leaders and believers. So point one is God's glory always has believing in mind. One of the reasons God's um, name is to be glorified is he draws people to himself. And we're going to see that in here. We're going to see that in other texts. But as it starts off, it says Jesus again groaning in himself. You know, I love that our Savior is a Savior of compassion. It says in Isaiah 53 that famous passage about Jesus going to the cross. It says, Isaiah 53, 3, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. But the very next verse says, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So he knows about grief. He knows about sorrow. He's gone, God goes through it himself. He understands, but he carries 
our griefs and sorrows. That's why you know, the Bible says, cast your burdens on him, cast your cares upon him, because he cares for you. It's been said, Jesus didn't die by the crucifixion or the scourging or the torture. He died of a broken heart. He died of a broken heart. His heart broke for all the sorrow and grief that death would bring as a result of sin. His heart also broke that many would reject him, the only cure. Jesus is the only cure. And it breaks his heart that people will reject him. And then in verse 39 through 41, twice we have, uh, we don't see the name Lazarus. Instead, we, re we read, he who is dead. So twice he, re he refers to Lazarus as a dead man. He wants us to remind us that this was a dead person when he gets ready to do a miracle. And then he tells us for four days he smelled because of decomposition. <clears throat> Anybody ever smelled a dead animal? <clears throat> it stinks. And it doesn't take long before the stench is just terrible. And that's what he's saying. Four days this guy was dead. Because he's getting ready to do a miracle. He wants us to know this was a dead person. He wasn't just, you know, they didn't resuscitate him quick enough or something. So no, he was dead. But then verse 40, he says, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? If you would, that's the, that's the whole key right there. If you believe, if you believe, all things are possible to him who believe. And he says, You would see the glory of God. See, back in verse 4, when this whole thing started, Jesus said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And so we see that God is up to something with that statement. And Mary and Martha, all they had was trust in Jesus. That's all they could do. They could trust him. I mean, Lazarus is dead. We're just going to trust Jesus. We don't know what to do. Well, I love this, for this, this quote I've heard for years, and many of you have heard it. You will never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Mm -hmm. And that's where they were. And many of you have been there, and many of us will be there. And it sounds like a tough place, but it's actually a great place when you realize Jesus really is all that we need. Because people are going to let us down, circumstances, life, but Jesus never will. See, when you or I as God's children believe and trust in him, especially when it's difficult, you will see the glory of God through yourself, through the way that you handle it. 1 Peter 4.16 says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God in this manner. 1 Peter was written to a lot of Christians that were suffering persecution and mistreatment and a lot of terrible things. But he reminds us throughout that book that if you suffer as a Christian, you bring glory to God. People look at you like, wow, there's something different about that guy. If it was me, I wouldn't be going through that. And Mary and Martha's faith was being tested. And you know what? They just needed to believe. They'd always believed in Jesus. Now they're saying, okay, now your belief is like the real deal. See, it's easy to believe and have faith when things are all going great. Everything's going in our favor. It's a piece of cake to trust God. When things are tough, that's when, that's when faith is faith. And I love how Jesus in verse 41 says, Father, well, like it says, they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, Lazarus, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I thank you that you've heard me. He thanks him knowing that God hears his prayer. What confidence? Do you know God hears your prayers? I hope you do. He does. Whether you believe it or not, he hears your prayers. But look at what he says in verse 42. And I know that you always hear me. He takes it another level. I know that you always hear me, not just sometimes. This is faith, knowing that God hears your prayer. And he knew the Father always heard him. And because of that, that is the reason he prayed so much, because he knew that God, the Father heard him. And that was one of the secrets to his success in prayer, because he knew the Father heard him. But then he says, because of the people, I said this, that they might believe. Because of the people. And once again, it's never about us. I know we think it's about us. It's, we've been trained that way in, in America and in the world. It's not about us. And as much as God loves you, he's always thinking of those that you will influence through your affliction, through your trial, through your disappointment, through your pain. He's looking at those that you are going to be a positive influence for God. Otherwise, he would have taken us home to heaven when we believed. Did you ever think of that? If God wasn't in the business of using us to be an influence in the lives of others, and we got saved, we go up to heaven. But he has a plan. He has a purpose for each one of us here. And it's a glorious plan, actually, when you enter into what God has for you. Now, notice this. In verse 5, way back in verse 5, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. But you know what? That's not the reason that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Not because he loved him. It tells us right here. Why? Because of the people 
that they might believe. All the way, then if you go, you fast forward to verse 45, then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. This was kind of the end game that God was trying to accomplish through this resurrection. And even in the, and throughout the Bible, there's a handful of resurrections. And I think of the one in Acts chapter 9 where Peter prayed for a, a girl named Tabitha, and she was raised from the dead. And then it says, And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Many believed in the Lord. And that leads to point two. God's glory is revealed in resurrection power. That's an amen moment right there. God's glory is revealed in resurrection power. I love the songs these guys picked in this today, you know. It's like, man, awesome. But you know what? He says, Lazarus, come forth. It's been said if he didn't use Lazarus' name that a whole bunch of dead people would come up. They just got to, well, Jesus called, you know. They were just raised from the dead, you know. But he said, no, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what? To come forth, you got to be alive. You're like, duh. Well, think about it. The moment of conversion, you come forth and you go from death to life. You go from darkness to light. You go from the power of Satan to the power of God. You who once were blind are now, uh, you see, you who once were lost, you are now found. Do you know that? Do you know that? Look at verse 44. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. I just visioned this guy coming out, you know, like the walking dead, you know. And I got to tell you, this song was in my head all week. He did the mash. He did the monster mash. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. But seriously, I think he took those grave clothes and he was dancing. And I think in the song, he turns the mourning into dancing. That's what it says in Psalm 3011. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth, how about grave clothes, and you have clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to God forever. That's what the resurrection does. That's what the healing of Jesus did. Uh, for those of you guys that have been watching the Chosen series, um, they had this guy that Jesus healed who had a bad leg and he, was, he couldn't work. He just was limping. When this guy gets healed, he just starts jumping up and down. He's like jumping, jumping, and everybody's just grabbing him. His family, they're just rejoicing. I think that's what happened with Mary and Martha and, and, um, and Lazarus here. It's funny you don't see that, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. If, if your loved one, your brother or sister came back to life, you would be rejoicing. And so anyways, he says, loose him and let him go. See, and then he talks about the great clothes. See, when Jesus gives us life, when do you get rid of the grave clothes? Did you know that? The grave clothes speak of the old life. They speak of death. Death. Are there some grave clothes, things you are holding on to the old life, things that you need to get rid of, things that are actually slowly bringing death? Maybe you don't even realize it. Luke 24, 5, I thought was interesting. We just talked about the resurrection not too long ago with Easter. But when the women came to the tomb, there was an angel, and he said, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. In other words, why are you looking for the life in the things that bring death? And I think that's a question Jesus has for us. Why are you seeking living life among the dead? See, this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. But there are things that are bringing death into our life. Why are some men still dabbling in pornography? It supposedly promises life, but you know what? It brings death. Why are some women and men giving in to gossip? They think it gives a life like it's really exciting. But you know what that does? It breeds death because it's character assassination to other people that aren't there to defend themselves. Why are some wasting their money, their talent, their time on things that don't even matter? And it's just a slow death. God wants us to, to live for him. And if there's things in our life that are slowing us down, that are holding us back that from the past, God is saying, get rid of those grave clothes, grave clothes. Loose and let him go. No more grave clothes. I love Isaiah 61, 3. This is a prophecy of Jesus that we see him. I came to preach the gospel. I came to heal the brokenhearted. I came to set the captives free. And then he says, we are given the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. What a great promise. He says, 
Come forth, loose him, and let him go. This is really a good description of the Christian life. Come forth, be born again, go from death to life. Loose him and let him go. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Repent of the old life and follow the Lord. That's what God wants to do in our lives. And he's done that in many of our lives. Jesus wants all of us to come forth. First, from death to life. But then he wants us to come forth into the abundant life. He doesn't just want us to, to, to save our soul. He wants to bless our life. That's what the abundant life. And the more we come to him, the more we experience of him. I think I shared this, uh, I might have shared this last week or the week before, but the word come, Jesus uses often. 635 of John, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Meaning that spiritual hunger that we have that is in our lives is, 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 is taken care of, is satisfied in him. And Jesus said in John 7, 37, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. It talks about the Holy Spirit. The more we come to Jesus, the more the Holy Spirit works in our life to pour into the lives of others. Jesus says, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus wants us to come to him. It's the old principle of draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. But as you draw near to God, you experience more of God. The Bible says in his light, we see light. Like we have more light. We have more revelation. We have more of him. And when we do, we can have him say to the powers of darkness, loose him. That's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Paul talks about the power of the resurrection. What a great verse, the power of the resurrection. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 20, Paul tells us that the resurrection power is towards us and it's for us. The resurrection power to live the Christian life. Romans 6 verses 4 through 6 says, Because of the resurrection power, we are no longer slaves to sin. 1 Peter 1 3 says, Because of the resurrection, we are born again to a living hope. That was one of our songs. We are born again to a living hope by the resurrection. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 says, Belief in the resurrection guarantees that we are going to be in the rapture. Go look up yourself. 1 Thessalonians 4.12 and then the, ongo the rest of the verses. And how about this? One of the prerequisites to being a possible... A possible. That's impossible. I said that. One of the prerequisites to be an apostle is to be a witness of the resurrection. The resurrection is such a powerful thing in the Bible. But then look at verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen the things Jesus did believed in him. Believed in him. Why did they come? This is the thing to think about. They came to comfort her because Lazarus was dead, not because Lazarus was sick. Think about that. Some people will come to visit when sick, but not all. But when that person dies, pretty much everybody comes. And they come to their memorial service. And that's what's going to happen here. In a sense, it's like a memorial service, but instead Jesus raises him from the dead. And it says that they had seen the things that Jesus did and they believed in him. Well, what did they see? Well, obviously they came and saw the resurrection. And like I was saying, when, when a loved one dies and there's a memorial service, if it's, if it's a good church and a good pastor, the story of the resurrection and life in Jesus is going to be laid out for them. And there's going to be an opportunity to have their, their sins forgiven and have eternal life. But I think of those that have lost loved ones, and often we think that that's the moment when that memorial service happens. But you know what? Really, this goes on throughout their life. They're going to glorify Christ as people remind them or ask them about, hey, remember your, your brother or your sister? You know, they remember that loved one. They're able to glorify Christ when, they, when their loved one is mentioned, and they see that person's focus on heaven and trusting in the Lord and in the future and living in God's goodness in the present. Let me say that again. When their loved ones are mentioned and they see their focus on heaven, on the hope for the future, and their trust in God in the present, that brings just glory, glory to God when they see that Christian trusting in the Lord. Now it says they had seen the things that Jesus did. First of all, they saw the faith in Jesus of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They saw their faith. First time you get sick, they're calling for Jesus. So they saw their faith in Jesus. Second, they saw the compassion of Jesus. He wept. He groaned in his spirit. We see he groaned again. Then they heard the prayer of Jesus. And they saw his confidence in his Father to answer that we just read about. 
And then they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. And you know what? All signs and wonders are primarily to point to Jesus for salvation. But the resurrection is at the top of the list. That's like the number one sign of all signs that points people to God. And you know, fast forward to chapter 12, verse 9 and 11. Let's read this really quick. This, is, this shows why the evil religious leaders were so quickly came after Jesus and after this miracle. Look at verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews came, um, knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Isn't that a sad statement of the religious leaders? People are getting saved because they saw somebody come to life to death and they want to go kill Jesus. Ay, yeah, yeah. You know, but the but the resurrection is so important because it tells us in first um first Corinthians fifteen, if the resurrection didn't happen, that our faith is ridiculous, it's it's futile, and we're still lost in our sins. But you know what? It did happen. This is one of the things that separates the Christian faith from all other faiths in the world the faiths in the world is our sin was dealt with by God, the Savior, who died on the cross and he rose from again from the dead. Nothing's even close to that. Nothing's even close. But in Acts 4.33, it says, With great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In Acts 17, we read that Paul's custom was to explain and demonstrate that Christ had to suffer for our sins and rise again from the dead. This is throughout the whole uh, Bible. And this needs to be part of our message when we share the gospel. The resurrection is part of the gospel. It's, it's like the finishing touch. If you leave that out, you miss out a, a, a key component. That's what it says in Romans 10, 9. If you believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The resurrection, you've got to know that. And that leads us to the last point. God's glory should be the highest priority for religious leaders and believers. It should be. Look at this, though. It just talked about these great things in verse 45. Many believed in him, verse 46, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. You think they were sharing a praise report? It sounds more like tattletaling, doesn't it? Like, oh, that Jesus, you know what he did this time? I'm like, yeah, that's pretty awesome. I'm sure Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were thinking that. But all these other bozos, they were, they were oh my gosh. Look at verse 47. It says, Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. You know what? Often when you hear of people gathering a council or a committee, it's usually not for good intentions. I was reading at Facebook. They had to, they put a committee together because they were get, kept getting questioned why they wouldn't let the former president have a Facebook account anymore. So these 20 people came together and they decided he does not need a uh, he does not need a Facebook account because he's a, he's dangerous and he's uh, he's inciting rebellion and sedition and all this stuff. Well, it came to find out all twenty of them were just people with a liberal progressive point of view. It's like they made their committee to what they wanted to do, and it was ill intent. That's what these guys are doing. They're making their committee. They probably didn't invite Nicodemus. They probably didn't invite Joseph of Arimathea because those were followers or lovers of Jesus. They probably invited people that wanted to agree with them. It's so sad, though, that they would not rejoice over the miracle of raising someone from the dead. Hello? Is that just great and amazing at the same time? How can you not cheer for that? Really, you know? But that's how hardened these guys are. It just, it just breaks your heart when you see this. But then check this out, verse 48. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. If we let him alone, everyone um, will believe in him. And then he says, but this is the reason why. They will take away our place in our nation. Our place? They're referring to the temple. They're saying it's our place? Uh, that's God's place. Hello? Maybe if you knew it was God's place and not your place, you'd have a different point of view. May we never have this mindset thinking this is our place or our church or my ministry. It's the Lord's. It's always the Lord's. This is what I found. If it's man's, it's not good. If it's God's, it's awesome. That's kind of something I just learned years ago. If somebody gives me a compliment, it's Jesus. If I did something wrong, it was me. <laughs> you know? It's man versus God. It's like there's not even a competition there. But this is what happened. This is what was really going on. As Jesus' influence was growing, 
They, the religious leaders, fear that the Romans would see this as a significant threat and take away their temple, which was their identity. But realistically, it was their power and prestige that they were worried about. That's what the religious leaders were worried about, was their power and prestige. They could, obviously, they could care less about God's honor in this. You can just see by their actions. I mean, they're, they're getting ready to break some of the commandments, right? Like, thou shalt not murder. Hello? One of the things the Lord hates is the shedding of innocent blood and, the, and planning evil plans and going towards evil plans, and that's what these guys are doing. They were, they were not thinking how all this would... They, or, I'm sorry. They were only thinking of how all this would affect them, not whether Jesus was the Messiah and that he was doing great works and miracles. It's just a mind-blower, but that's the truth. But I found this fasting. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Let me say that again. If we let him alone like this, everyone believe in him. Guys, that's what cancel culture is all about. If they don't cancel that, that, that message that's against what they believe in is going to get out and people are going to believe in him. That's exactly what they're worried that their message is not going to be taken serious because this other message, which is always a better message, they have no concept of free speech, only their speech. That's just like the Pharisees. They only care about their speech. They don't want to hear anybody else's thing. And then in verse 50, it's interesting. He says, Caiaphas makes this statement that one man should die for the people. And he was urging them to put Jesus to death. And then in verse 51, he says that one man should die for the nation. But then John says that he unconsciously prophesied. God allowed him to say this. He didn't even know that God was prompting him to say this. And I love how it says in 50, verse 52, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. We just read about this in John 10, 16, where Jesus says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. That's what this was prophesying about. I love how it says it in Ephesians, where Jesus says, or it does this with the Apostle Paul, it says, Jesus is our peace who has made both one. He's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. And he's broken down the middle wall of separation. For through him, we both have access by one spirit to the Father. See, God is the great unifier. Jesus is the answer to all this racism garbage that's going on. Racism is a man-made a man -made problem. But Jesus, he brings people together. He breaks down the middle wall of separation. He brings all together that we can all go to the Father. I love that. And then verse 53, this is really sad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Sadly, this was the religious, the religious leaders' end game all along. It's a sad, but it's true. That's what they were all about. Verse 54, we read that Jesus no longer walked openly among the Gentiles, but went from there into the country. He went into the country, and he no longer walked openly among the Jews. Now, is this giving into fear, or is this wisdom? It's wisdom. Years ago, my bride and I went to a security conference the Samaritan's Purse put out, very enlightening, about all the evil that's in the world and all the different things. And they were talking about there are certain times that like there's a, a religious um, um, ministry that would go, and when they went in like to like a Muslim stronghold, they would just take the cross off the side of their vehicle. And it wasn't that they were scared but they probably wouldn't even get into the city to share the gospel with who they were going to share with. So they were looking at it like, we're going to temporarily fly under the radar to open a door in the near future. If they were just saying, we're Christians, cross goes, to kill us. They probably got killed and everyone got to the ministry, you know. So Jesus was timing things. He eventually is going to come and he's going to share, I am him and I am everything. But right now he's not 100% openly doing things. So he's going in the country. But look what it says in verse 55. And the pastor of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Jesus took the ministry into the country, so when he went back into the city of Jerusalem for the feast, they came with him. They said, we love this Jesus, man. We've got to have more of this. And it's amazing. But notice this. It says, and many believed. Well, actually, I want to jump back to verse 55. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things did believed in him. And all this is happening because of the resurrection and what happened around it. Many believed in him. 
But it's interesting, if you look down in verse 55, it says, um, The Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Many went. Wouldn't you think the religious leaders would say, Wow, there's so many people here. They're coming to the Passover temple. They're coming to be purified. Praise the Lord. They didn't say praise the Lord. You know why? Look at verse 56. Then they sought Jesus. If they weren't seeking Jesus, they'd be all for it. But because Jesus' name was in it, they were not for it. They wanted nothing to do with it. But I love verse 56. They sought Jesus. They sought Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. You want to know God? You want to know God at a deeper level? Seek him with all your heart. Seek him with all your mind. Seek him with all your soul, with all your strength. How are you seek at seeking God? I love how it says in, in Hebrews eleven six 6, that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder. If you diligently seek him, he is going to bless you. You're going to experience more of God. That's what these people were trying to do. And then verse 57, both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. That's a sad commentary on the religious leaders. But you know what? Take those knuckleheads out of here, and this chapter is explosive with hope. It's explosive with hope. Mary and Martha had their sorrow turned into joy. This is much like the, the prodigal son father, or the father of the prodigal son. In, in um, Luke 15, 24, he threw a party and rejoiced because he said, this my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and is found, and they began to be married. And that's what happens in the spiritual realm. Okay, this was a physical resurrection, but this also points to a spiritual thing that happens in the lives of people. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.1 that you and I, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2.4 says, But God who is rich in mercy because of his great love which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And this is what happens when you become born again. Like Lazarus, we were all dead in our trespasses and sin, and we heard his voice say, come forth. And you know what? We came forth, we took off our grave clothes, and we said, man, I'm all in. I'm following this Jesus. Or as Colossians 2.13 says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. But I was also reminded how the resurrection is in the Old Testament in a, in a bunch of different ways. Remember Abraham? Father Abraham had many sons. Okay, so Father Abraham used to be Abe or Abram. And God told him at 75, I'm going to make a nation out of you. It's going to be so many, you won't be able to count them. It'll be like the sand of the sea and the stars in the, eye, in the sky. Well, guess what? 24 years later, he's 99 years old. And God says, Keep following Moses, or keep following Abraham, be blameless. In fact, I'm changing your name to Abraham. Father of multitude. And Abraham's like, is that a joke? Father of multitude? Well, little did he know that he was going to have that son, Isaac. But then after that, after Isaac was born, God told Abraham to do the unthinkable. He said, take your son, your only son, and in uh, chapter 22 of Genesis, and go offer him as a sacrifice up on Mount Moriah. Now, God never intended to have him sacrifice his son, but it says he tested him. In fact, it says this in Hebrews eleven seventeen, 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Who else is a begotten son that we've heard about in the scriptures? Jesus, Jesus right. And then he says, oh, listen, listen to this. Of whom it is said, in Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he received him in a figurative sense. Abraham had such faith in God. He knew if I even followed God on this, he would resurrect him from the dead. You know what? That's a prophecy of Jesus Christ. Abraham would be um, like God the Father offering up his son Jesus. And it says right when he took the knife to to do the work, or it says an angel stopped him. And it's always been said, aren't you glad God wasn't hard of hearing, you know? He said, Abraham, stop! 
And all of a sudden he looks and there's a ram in the thicket and God provided a substitute. And that's what God did. He provided Jesus as a substitute. But this is also written in Romans 4, 17. As it is written, talking about Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of whom he believed. Listen to this. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. I want to read that again. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. There's people that you and I are praying for that God's saying they're going to come to life. And we're like, what do you mean? He calls the things that don't exist as if they do. He knows that they're going to have eternal life. You know why? Because you and I are praying for them. We are praying for people to raise them from the dead. And you know, this is exactly what God did um, in the book of Ezekiel. Have you guys heard of Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones? Mm -hmm. The valley of dry bones. This is a prophecy. If, everybody, if somebody says, Oh, I believe the God, the Bible, it's a bunch of fairy tales. Take the Ezekiel 47. Ezekiel 47 is a prophecy of God bringing Israel back into the land after 1900 years. Israel's the only country that lost their country and then came back to it. They did it twice. Remember they got kicked out of Babylon and came back? Then after Jesus, it was for like 1900 years and then 1948 they came a nation. But this is what he says in the prophecy. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. God is showing us in this prophecy of the dry bones, that's what God does to people. They are dead. A bones mean death, right? You see skull and crossbones and all you know those kind of things. That's death. But God speaks life through the word. He said, prophesy the word of the Lord. And when the word of the Lord goes out to people and they recognize they're dead in their sin and they give their life to Jesus, they become born again. They go from death to life. They were spiritually dead and now they are alive in Christ. And it's literally like the Bible says, it's like going from night to day, right? From being blind to see. And that's my hope with John 11. Two things. That it would give hope to those who are going through tough times and glorify the Lord. Secondly, it would encourage us to pray for those we love who are dead in sin, who need to come forth to life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And as we pray for that, and we share that when we can, let's believe it, that God is going to do a great work in people's lives. And he's going to bring them from, from death to life. Amen? Amen? Bow your heads for a word of prayer, please. Lord, we come before you right now. And Lord, we believe, Father, in your resurrection power. And Lord, I do pray for all my brothers and sisters. I know many of them are going through some very challenging circumstances right now. And I pray that they would know and they would realize, Lord Jesus, how much you love them. And Lord, you are glorifying your name through their life. Give them strength to continue to move forward and to seek your face and to draw strength from you. And let them know that you have not forgotten them. You're working. You're working even when they don't see it, Lord. So you bless them. And secondly, Lord, we want to lift up those ones that we know that don't know you, that we love, and that we've been praying for. Father, we pray that they would hear your voice say, come forth. And they would come, and they would come out of darkness into your light. And they would go from dead to life in you, Father. And we believe and trust in that. And I pray this would inspire us to do that more. And Lord, if there's anybody hearing this message that is not sure of where they are in, in life, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? If you're hearing this and you're not 100% sure where you are in your relationship with God, if you're not sure that when you die, you would go to heaven, if you're not sure that your sins are forgiven, if you want that guilt taken away, that's all you need to do is put your faith in Jesus Christ. This is all you need to do. Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I ask for you to forgive me. I believe you're the Savior. I believe you died on the cross again. And I believe you rose again from the dead. And I want to follow you all the days of my life. Make me one of your children. That's all you need to do. Just reach out to the Lord. You can do it now. You can do it later. You can do it in your bedroom when you get on your knees at night and God starts talking to you. But give your life to Jesus. 
And we ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.